Boy, I wasn't expecting such a crowd, so I'm glad you guys came out this morning, and I hope to give you some useful and knowledgeable information. Um, what I'm going to cover today is really an update on our research uh, fr from when we started back in June of 2013. Some of the results we have, some of it we don't, but I want to give you a scope of what's been going on and then some information that we do have. So just a brief history. Um, I'm sure you've heard this before, but PED was first identified in the United States May 16th of 2013. And so we had that confirmed by the National Veterinary Services Laboratory in Ames, Iowa. And so that was something that we had found at that time in multiple farms. And since that time, it's been a very collaborative effort to try to address this disease and what do we do for control and management and also understanding the impact of the virus in our production systems. In May, when this was identified, obviously this was a new disease to the United States, and we had very, very limited information on what the virus did, what it looks like in production, how long does it survive. And so as we got together to really discuss this information or the lack of information, it was really evident that we needed to be able to build our uh, body of knowledge and do that very, very quickly. And so to do that, our board uh, at the National Pork Board has been very aggressive and very forthright in approving funds for use for research for PED. And these are your direct checkoff dollars at work. So since that time, since May of 2013, there's been roughly $2 million worth of uh, funds that have been focused solely on PED. However, just recently at the board meeting, there was another $886,000 approved for use, again, for ongoing discussions and research for PED, including a risk assessment for pathways and just additional basic research on the virus. So it's been, there's been a tremendous amount of focus on this. So where are we at today? Well, we do know we have uh, PED identified in at least 30 different states across the, uh, across the U.S., and those are really predominantly in the majority of our swine-producing states. We do have a case count or case report, and that's about 6,800 head or 6,800 cases of PED identified. That number is not farms. All that is is just the number of diagnostic submissions that are turned into a veterinary laboratory. And then those laboratories in return report how many cases they have on a weekly basis. So while it's not an incidence of what's going on in the U.S., at least it gives us a count whether this virus is going up, down. There is other information that is done on a research project uh, by Dr. Bob Morrison, the Swine Health Monitoring Project that there's voluntary information that's being submitted that does show um, about 17, about, it covers 700 different herds that voluntary provide information, and it does show a weekly incidence of PED. Um, and so there is that information out there. However, this is what we know to date. If you're looking for the case count, that can be accessed at the American Association of Swine Veterinarians website, and that's listed on there at www.aasv.org. So for us at the Pork Board, we obviously have a couple of different things that we're focusing on. Research really was the first one, especially in my area, so we needed to have that going. But there's also the component of development of commu uh, communication and producer resources, because what we learn from our research, we need to put into action and put into press. There is also discussion and focus on containment and management strategies, and that's really a group and collaborative effort between American Association of Swine Veterinarians, the National Pork Producers Council, and U.S. Department of Agriculture. And so that's also going on as we speak. So really, to get to the meat of the, pro uh, the program is our research efforts. Just to give you a little bit of background, how is our research priorities developed? Well, there's several different groups. Primarily, we look to our Swine Health Committee, which is a group that we have within the National Pork Board comprised of producers, veterinarians, um, researchers, other organization representatives, that includes university and government, all those folks get together and help us determine what are our areas of need, what are the gaps in research, and where do we need to focus our time and dollars. Other groups include our PED Strategic Task Force. That's a group, again, made up of uh, veterinarians, representatives from our industry, and also government, which also helps to continue to provide us input on where needs are coming from. 
We do have regular memberships, both from the professional organizations as well as NPPC. State pork associations also provide input from their constituents. And then I don't have included, but are a very integral component, our international counterparts. So we've been working very closely with several different groups out of Canada, um, Ontario Pork Association, Genome Canada, as well as PigGen Canada. And they all have been very active in our process and a lot of uh, communication on research priorities. So in June, we really didn't have an understanding of a lot of the basics of the virus. And so some of the things that we really wanted to focus on are the basic understandings and pathogenesis of PED. How much virus does it take to infect? When you infect a pig, what does it do? What does it look like? What tissues does that virus go to? So we really needed to understand that, and that was a priority one. The second one was continued development of our diagnostic tests. Because early on in, in the identification of the virus, we had only a few tests and we were still trying to make sure those worked at identifying the virus and then trying to develop additional tests that covered more samples types. Um, so we were looking at both antigen and antibody testing to really be able to identify the virus itself, but also can we determine if a pig has been exposed to the virus. So those things were very important. Environmental stability was extremely important because we really didn't understand how long does the virus survive in the pig, how long does the virus survive outside of the pig, and then how long does that virus survive in a whole bunch of different sample types and substrates. So that was very important. And then lastly, but not least, is the epidemiology. And what that means is where did the disease transmit? How did it transmit? Are there other risk factors that can be associated with an increase or a decrease in infection? And so we really didn't understand that as well, and that really needed to be focused on. And so our committee did fund eight total proposals that covered all of those basic key areas, and we'll go over what we learned in a minute. So we got that part going. The next thing that happened in the fall of 2013, as the first sets of proposals were being run, there was additional questions on sow immunity. You know, we had some herds that broke in May. They're now coming around where they're starting to clean up. But there was a lot of questions on how is sow immunity developed? How does that mama pig protect her piglets? And how are they protected downstream? And how long does that last? A lot of those questions came up, and we did not have any answers for that. And so, again, we went back to our committees, went back to our allied industry and our other associations and said, hey, what are some things you're seeing out in the field that don't make sense that we need to research? So we focused that. Again, at the same process, we, we had proposals submitted to us, and we funded three proposals on duration of immunity, optimizing feedback, and then also continuing to develop diagnostic tests that can hone in on saying, if we have this level of antibody in the animal, this also means protection. So we're trying to ferret all of those things out. Other areas of concern that started to come about towards the tail end of last year was the issue of feed. Feed was identified as a risk factor early on. The American Association of Swine Pre uh, Veterinarians actually did an epi survey on the first few farms that broke. And some of the risk factors that were identified were feed was one of those. And so we really didn't have a way to assess if feed was a, an issue or not. Um, a lot of people had anecdotal information, but we really didn't have anything hard and fast that said, yes, feed could transmit or no, it could not. And so that came back to the group, and we really wanted to have some initial focus on that question. And then also disinfections came up as an issue. How do we know do disinfectants denature the virus um, to yield a PCR negative result or not, or can that even happen? So all those things occurred. Now just to give you guys an idea, on the first proposals that we funded in June, we asked for a very quick turnaround time. Normally our research process goes anywhere between 12 to 18 months because a lot of these things take some time to investigate. When we went back in June and looked at all those proposals, we asked the researchers to really kind of kick it in and say, can you give us this information within six months? And that was a very aggressive timeline, but we got that done. When we were looking at sow immunity, we realized to address some of those issues, those proposals would have to have a bit longer time frame of about 12 months in order to really address immunity over a lifetime of a sow and also through the pig production cycle. And I'll tell you why that makes a difference. 
because we needed to get results early in June, we started to get our finals or at least interim reports back as of December of last year. And so the basic information comes from those proposals that were studied in June. So what do we know about PED? Well, we do know that the, the clinical signs, the diarrhea starts anywhere between two to three days post-infection. It may happen sooner depending on the load of virus or how much virus a pig gets exposed to. And at least in the laboratory settings of what we're seeing, it stops, the shedding may stop after 10 days, or excuse me, the diarrhea may stop after 10 days post-infection as long as the pig survive. Severity, we have also noted, is age dependent. Um, a lot of you guys that have experienced this on farm know that the neonatal pig or the baby pig um, does not survive well under infection. And so that's why we see a lot of mortality in that younger pig age. However, as that pig ages and gets older, we do see increased survivability. The animals still show clinical signs. However, the death loss is not always present in those older age of pigs. Again, in the laboratory setting, it was noted that the viral shed starts anywhere 24 to 48 hours post-infection and typically peaks at five to six days. That's on looking at feeder pigs and the majority of pigs. However, we do know that there can be continued viral shed for up to 35 days, at least according to the study that was done. And this is important because if you're trying to look at cleanup of the farm, and if you see clinical signs stopping around 10 days, but virus continues to shed up to 30, 35 days, there's a window of time where you may not see disease, but that virus is still actively present on your farm. And so that makes a big difference when you're trying to look at how you assess cleanup, how you assess exposure, et cetera. So PED, one of the things that we wanted to know is did that shed via an aerosol or on respiratory droplets? When we did the study or the study was done in the laboratory setting, it was identified it was not exhaled like, say, another virus that would come from the respiratory tract. However, there can be, there is some later evidence that shows that it may be able to move on the wind, and I'll get into that. But at least in the strict laboratory setting when this was first done, it did not appear that PED transmitted via the air. So the next two parts, really we had to look at culturing this virus to be able to get it to grow. And that's important because as we develop diagnostic tests, you want to be able to have enough virus to have your test find the virus. Well, this virus is very picky. It does not like to grow under normal cell culture conditions in a petri dish. And so that's something we actually had to focus time on. The other part of that is for vaccine development. A lot of people ask, why don't we have a vaccine now? It's a year later. This is part of the reason, because that virus is very difficult to grow. And in order to make a vaccine to get a response, you have to have enough virus to do that. If you can't grow it, then you have a hard time moving downstream and trying to stimulate immunity. The next step was, again, continuing to develop our diagnostic tests, because we have a lot of things. We were originally testing for virus. And that's what the PCR is, the polymerase chain reaction test. That detects the actual virus genome or RNA. But we also needed to look at exposure using the ELISA test. And so that was ongoing. And then also looking at how do we correlate what we see in the blood versus immunity. And some of those were the IFA test and a new test called FFN. And I'll, I've gotten more descriptions in some of the books. But let's, these tests are focusing on immunity. We also wanted to look at sequencing. Is the virus changing? Is it not? And then how do we tell, you know, with our efforts, are there new viruses coming in or what's, what's just happening? So we developed that down the road. And then also looking at diagnostic tests that can also test for more than one disease. Because if you're submitting samples, and for some of these samples you have to euthanize pigs and take tissue, the last thing you want to do is to have, you know, one pig for every single test that you run. And so we try to maximize the samples that are provided and do multiple testings on one sample. So we were, there's uh, researchers that were looking at how do we look for d diseases of scours in pigs anyway. So TGE, PED, and rotavirus, so that way we could tell what's going on in the pig all at once. And then lastly, we wanted to validate samples because, again, you know, if the sample or if the test can't really detect the virus at a certain level, it's not doing us a whole lot of good. 
And so we also wanted to look at other sample types like the saliva, the rote testing, or oral fluids, but then also look at our feed samples, our environmental samples, whether it be manure or truck wash water. How can we you know, efficiently test those and understand what's going on with that virus? So when we came to survival, this research was done at University of Minnesota. Um, really, we looked at fresh feces, uh, and we found that the virus can last at least 14 days at 104 and 122 degrees Fahrenheit. But as you increase the temperature, it was only seven days. And this, again, these are laboratory-based experiments. These were not field-based, so I do want to make that clear. But at least we had the range of survivability. Then in slurry, manure slurry, again, very similar. It was about 14 days at 77 degrees, so that was yesterday's high. And then, however, in cold weather, it does appear in slurry that the virus can last greater than 28 days. And I say that because the study only went up to 28 days at that time, and it was still viable, so that's as far as we tit or the, the researcher titrated out. But it does tell us the virus likes cool, moist temperatures. Dry feeds, as we assess feeds, you could see survival in feed through one week, but not at two weeks time. So that was of concern. And then if you look at a, a feed slurry or wet feed, it was positive, PCR positive at 28 days, but we did not see any diarrhea in pigs between one to three weeks. So there is again, some time frame in there where the virus may survive, but for the trial design, it was on a week basis, so there is a little bit of discrepancy in the time. Regardless, it tells us this virus is pretty capable of surviving under different conditions, so that's of concern. The amount of virus that needs to infect a pig is extremely low, and that was something that was a little bit surprising because some of our other viruses, we know it takes at least a baseline level, but PED seemed to have a very infect high, you know, didn't take much to infect a pig. And the virus is shed in quite a large amount, especially in these younger baby pigs. And so that was also of concern. When we assessed metal surfaces, so a trailer, this trial was done uh, utilizing a trailer model. So we put feces into this trailer and assessed it at various time and temperature combinations. And what we found out is that 106 degrees, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, when sustained for 10 minutes, would kill the virus. And so that was something that we identified. On the flip side, if you didn't have the baking capacity, it was found that if you held those trailers at 68 degrees Fahrenheit for seven days, that would also inactivate the virus. That's quite a wide range. Um, the, the, one of the steps that the researcher that did this project, who was out of Iowa State, was looking to expand that and trying to titrate down what are the different time and temperature combinations to kill that virus versus just these two kind of extremes. And so that work is ongoing. Even though I see a lot of people writing, there is a lot of information online at pork.org um, that we have a lot of these research results. If you go to www.pork.org backslash PED, all of these research updates are available and has even more detail. I'm just summarizing what's there right now. The other thing we wanted to look at epidemiology, and so we were trying to assess risk factors. And the Swine Health Monitoring Project is one of those things that's doing that, and I've got the address up here where it's at. So we looked at North Carolina trying to say, what are risk factors in a high-dense swine area that maybe lead to more increased infection? And so what we found is the location you know, near a positive site was a risk factor, and intuitively that makes sense. If you're close to a positive farm, you're probably going to break. And so what they found, within one to two miles, you had a higher chance of becoming positive than if you were beyond three miles next to a positive farm. But the most interesting thing was the other risks. So the more times that someone went in and out of a farm, whether it was for dead haul, feed haul, trash pickup, um, the increased times that a person was in and out of a farm, and that may not have been the, the farm workers, but the support staff, that was more likely to be associated with an increased break. And so those, that information is available on that website in detail. Other things that we were looking at was in Oklahoma to look at the airborne spread or the question of airborne spread of the virus. 
And so the analysis that was done is suggesting that, yes, there can potentially be some carriage of PED on the wind. Because when they assessed all of those farms that were in the study, um, there was, that was one of the highest risk factors that was associated with a positive infection. However, there's still a lot of ongoing research out in the industry really to validate that. And I know there's been several studies um, out of Minnesota that have also shown the potential for this virus to be carried uh, via wind. And so lastly, I was going to uh, mention that Swine Health Monitoring Project, that's where 718 premises are signed up, and that show kind of a weekly incidence of disease. And so that, that is actually uh, where people are reporting that they have PED to the researcher, and then they can put together a graph of where that's going. Transportation, a lot of work was done on trucking. And some of the first studies that were done in June uh, was by uh, Jim Lowe out of the Midwest. They were in, at a lot of other veterinarians and researchers trying to assess the risk on trucks. And so they swabbed a whole bunch of different trucks, large areas, chutes to identify was there a virus present or not. At the same time, uh, Dr. Matthew Turner went down and looked at a lot of buying stations in North Carolina, again, to identify where is PD, is it even here, is it not? And so basic results, there was virus found in all of the packing plants in the Midwest study, but not all plants were equally contaminated. And so some of them had a higher level than others, but they all had some degree of PED. Virus was also found in the North Carolina buying stations, both in facilities and in the animals. And so really our take home from that is transportation does pose a risk. Again, when you're hauling live animals and this virus is fecal oral transmitted and transmitted via the feces, it would stand to reason that if you have pigs in a truck, they're going to have manure in the truck, that that could be a mechanism for transfer. And so more time someone is at a plant walking through the facility than getting back into their trailer or truck, that leads to a higher risk of bringing infection back into the farm. Cross-contamination between the plant and the farm is also a high risk. So again, anytime you're having to cross traffic between the plant operations and the farm operations, or even with buying stations. And so we did confirm vehicles can serve as a vector to transmit the disease. So. PED is fecal-oral. It can survive a long time uh, in damp, moist conditions. Transportation and trucking is a big risk that we need to be aware of. But virus can be killed at certain time and temperature combinations. Um, other things in focus on biosecurity, like limiting contact time in high-risk areas, and also cleaning barns and removing manure out of contaminated premises is a big deal. Um, Providing a barrier between you and your farm is a big one. So a lot of times you hear us talk about changing boots, changing coveralls. That's a huge take home. If you're going somewhere where you think is contaminated, you want to make sure you're not wearing the same clothing and footwear that you do when you go back to your farm. Or shower in, wash your hands, wash your boots. That, that's a huge one for this disease. And then focus needs to be continued on just, you know, basic cleaning, disinfection, sanitation, making sure we can reduce that viral load out on farm. So, okay, now we get to 2014. What else do we need to know? We still need to understand sow immunity because we're having some additional questions come up about why are we seeing rebreaks? How are these farms not reacting? We did everything we should have, and now we're seeing problems. How long does that immunity last? How do we measure that? Um, what's the best way to assess our feed and feed sampling and feed systems for risk for PED? And then what steps can we take to make that a safe process? And so for the spring, um, we had, a, again, a committee call that was already scheduled. And so we looked at different things to continue to validate our diagnostic tests, also continue to survey PED because we wanted to have continued understanding of is this disease going up, down, staying the same, what's happening? And then also wanted to continue to assess our disinfectants at, at the ability to, you know, denature PED. So what do we know at least right now for sow immunity? And this is very, very preliminary. We're just starting to get some results back. Um, sow immunity is developed and can be measured. And so some of that ties in with the diagnostic test. We're working with researchers to, to be able to identify that using the ELISA and antibody tests. And then also to make sure that we can assess feedback protocols. So when we have to do exposure to animals, what's the right way to do it? So we're working on how that can be done. 
immunity initially does not appear to be as long lasting as we thought. Um, you know, we use TGE for comparison of a lot of our plans and programs. Well, TGE seems to have a different profile than PED, so now the next step is to understand why. And then lastly, I just mentioned new tests are being developed. So these are very, very preliminary and are posted online at pork.org. So our next step on research for 2014, we were focusing on feed, and there was a lot of questions associated with feed, feed systems, moving feed, ingredients, et cetera. And so back in March 19th, we got a huge group together, a feed consortium of industry, academia, um, feed industry folks, producers, and veterinarians to get together and say, what do we need to really understand about PED and feed? And so that group met in Iowa. We discussed our research priorities, developed those, and sent out a call for proposals. Um, at the same time, we were working very closely with our Canadian counterparts and saying, hey, guys, here's our focus. Here's some things that we don't have research covering on. How can we work together to get that done? Feed was one of them as well as genomics. So there was a lot of activity going on this spring. And so really some of the things that we're focused on was investigate the effectiveness of feed ingredient treatments. What do we do to mitigate PED if it is in the feed or in the feed system somewhere? We also wanted to show what's the viral dose curve, or at least how, how can that impact on time and temperature when we're looking at pelleting? Does that you know, decrease the dose? Does it impact PED? We didn't know. And then develop the appropriate diagnostic test to be able to tell, even if you have a positive feed sample, does that mean the virus is going to infect something or not? We didn't know that. And so our focus, we, the Swine Health Committee again reconvened and we funded an additional eight proposals um, that highlighted these key areas. So one of the things is really to go back and do an, a, a comprehensive risk assessment on in, feed ingredients and say, how likely is this to infect a pig? And so we have that going on and that's going to be very important. Um, the other one is really evaluate feed mills and transmission along the continuum of how feed ingredients are brought in, how feed is made, how feed is delivered, and assess across that continuum of where does the virus come in or not, and how can we evaluate that. So that's really a survey very similar to what we did at the packing plants, but we're hoping to identify key areas of risk in that system. Um, looking at uh, time and temperature of pelleting, looking at even birds as a transmission source. Um, a lot of that research that was done long ago on starlings was based on TGE. The committee felt that we needed to update that for PED and see are those transmission methods the same. And then the last one is looking at alternatives for bioassay. And a bioassay is basically where you take a, a sample that is known, is known or not known to be infective and put that back into a live pig that has never seen that virus. Because again, since we have a difficult time putting this virus into culture, you can't just take that, that virus sample and put it on a cell in a petri dish. And so that only leaves us having to put it back into pigs. And that's a very difficult test to do because it takes a lot of pigs to get an answer. It's costly to do, um, and it's not always as sensitive to really be able to hone in on what we need. So we were trying to look at alternatives. And at the same time, we had extreme very nice support from our feed industry partners, the National Grain and Feed Association, the American Feed, oh gosh, Ingredient Association, Cargill, as well as several state associations that also pitched in monies um, for feed specific proposals. And so this is a very collaborative effort. And then we also got a lot of other support in kind of time comments from just about everybody across the feed industry um, whatsoever. So that's been very, very valuable. <coughs> And so other things that we did, that was the feed side. We also knew there were still live animal issues. And during this time, we had more and more reports that there was swine delta coronavirus come up, or porcine delta corona. And so since that was a new virus that was identified, again, we're back in the same spot. We don't have a lot of baseline about that. And so the committee felt that we really needed to work that virus up very similarly to what we did with PED. And so again, we went back to our diagnostic laboratories and said, okay guys, help us out. How widespread is this? What diagnostic tests do you currently have or not have? Um, what are the capabilities of the lab? Do you know anything about how pathogenic this is? So we went back to our veterinary labs and said, hey, can you help us out also determining what our priorities are? 
So we got a lot of very valuable information from all of our veterinary labs that helped service the swine industry to tell us where we needed to go for research. And so another research proposal was again posted um, in April. We funded those or reviewed and funded them on the 22nd. And so that was extremely helpful. And again, working with our partners in Canada to also share our objectives and, and see where they can help us out as well. So animal research that we did, um, again, looking at PCV, or excuse me, wrong one, PED and porcine delta coronavirus, understanding pathogenesis and then development of additional diagnostic tests. And so these are all the things that we funded. I'm not going to read them off, but it's a really big list. But again, a lot of this is geared towards looking at some basic understanding for porcine delta coronavirus. And so that was something that we, we very much needed. And so that is ongoing. Like I said, that was just funded as of the end of April. And so we don't have any information on that. But those are also going to be six-month proposals. And we should start to get information out here within the next several weeks. So again, all of this information can be identified at pork.org um, backslash PED. And so we do have updates on a uh, biweekly or every other week basis. A lot of the information that we funded this year is just now starting to come out. But that, if you're interested in a lot of the research updates, that's where that information is housed. And so something aside from research, um, we get all this information, so how do we get it back out there? Well, we utilize the website, but we also wanted to make sure that you all as producers, researchers, veterinarians, people in the industry can have access to the information and timely. So we've worked with our communications folks to have a dedicated site, and that's where that information is housed. We also wanted to put together resources, knowing what we did about the virus. Again, gives everybody a guideline of what's going on. And so we put together all different folks from the different aspects and perspectives of the industry together to help us address key areas of need of biosecurity, of diagnostic testing, of manure handling. And so again, we had a lot of the same groups that were involved in the research priorities also working with us on developing producer resources. And so you can see all the folks here, all of the main industry uh, partners, our strategic task force, our working groups that consisted of other veterinarians, and they were extremely pivotal in helping us get all this information collated and back out in a usable form. And so these are some of the examples. Uh, this just happens to be the transportation guidelines that cover feed delivery biosecurity, trucking biosecurity, truck wash biosecurity. Um, manure handling, because at the time we were coming into the fall season and wanted to be able to provide resources. And so we had to get all that information out there. Other resources include uh, exhibitor and organizer biosecurity, because our show sector is, is part of our industry. And we wanted to be able to make sure that we can support those folks, help provide information so they, they can make assessments on their risk procedures and protocols in order to still have shows and support the industry. Other things are diagnosis of, of PED. What do you do in the case that you have a herd that goes positive? How do you clean it up? Um, so we, there's a lot of things in there. And so if at the door there is these books that contain all of our current fact sheets, um, this is the one from June, so there's several additional pieces. Also, we don't have any here, but if you go online, there is also Spanish versions of these um, biosecurity protocols and all the fact sheets. So we have both an English and a Spanish versions of that. So in summary, PED and porcine delta corona are emerging diseases. Obviously, they've been very, very costly to the industry, um, but we've got the, a research process in place to try to assess these and get answers and continue to get answers for this. Um, collaboration and cooperation between all of our industry partners in the U.S. is critical, but also with our international collaborators as well, because this isn't just a U.S. problem. It's worldwide, and so we want to make sure that we do have that collaboration to get that under control and understood. Um, and so we will continue to look at that as far as we assess our disease management and control. You know, can we eliminate this virus? Can we not? What do we do next? And then lastly, this, this PED brings up a whole other issue of emerging diseases. And so our group was working very closely um, to really assess what do we need to do in the case of another event. I'd love to say that we won't see these other types of viruses, but if you look at our past history, 
You know, we had uh, the influenza A virus of swine come in and hit us in two, uh, 2009 that did not origi originate here. We've had porcine circovirus issues, porcine cubovirus, it's a newer virus. So there are viruses out there circulating that could have a devastating impact on us. And so we're in the active process of developing a, a guideline, an outline of what do we need to do in the event that this happens again so we can be more proactive um, and identify these viruses. And I think that's all I have. So I will open it up for questions. Yes, sir. Right. Um, the, the question was, where are we in the process of vaccines? Right now, the committee has not funded vaccine studies per se because the, the, the amount of cost and outlay to do that is extremely huge. However, there are several companies out there. Um, the Harris Vaccines right now does have a current vaccine that is available by prescription from a veterinarian. Um, so that's on the market. And then there's other companies, bigger companies, that are actually working on that vaccine right now. Our Canadian counterparts also just just have a call for research focusing solely on vaccine. And so there's activity out there, but it's, it's underway. And like I said, there's only one vaccine I know right now that is available.